Good evening and welcome to another edition of Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Derbyologist, and joining me again this week is Cap'n with Candace. And Candace, an exciting Kentucky Do Oaks and Kentucky Derby last week. First off, let's start with the performance by Untappable in the Kentucky Oaks. To me, Untappable was the highlight of the weekend. I mean, yes, we had um, two big favorites in the big stakes in the Derby and the Oaks, but Untappable just won so, so easily against what I think was a more legit field. We talked last week about how, you know, we've seen so many injuries in the three-year-old male crop, but not necessarily with the girls. And she just pretty much trounced the nice field, minus Sophia, I think, some pretty nice horse, and she just demolished her, and she finished in second. Um, we didn't quite get the pace scenario that we expected um, with Fashion Plate um, and Sugar Shock not getting up there. Um, well, it, not Sugar Shock did, but Fashion Plate. Um, blew the break, so it made for a little more uh, moderate pace than maybe we anticipated, but it didn't matter. Um, Untappable was much, much, much the best in that race. What was nice about the Oaks was that Untappable on paper came in as the horse clearly to beat, and you know that's usually what happens when you have a clearly faster horse. Uh, she won in dominating fashion, and then what's nice to see is when they beat a horse that by four lengths, and then you got another five lengths back to third place finish. Mm -hmm. And then when you also get a high speed figure, that pretty much validates it, you know, both visually and with a number and just with the performance, you know, on the track. That stamps her as the best of the three year old fillies. Um, they're already saying a few of these horses might come out of there. We'll see which ones go to the acorn and, and cut back, and then we'll see. Uh, It'll be interesting to see if any of them go to the Black Eyed Susan, although right now we haven't heard anything. Rhea Antonia, possibility for the Derby. Now for the Kentucky Derby, uh, you know, basically the talk going in was California Chrome, and there was, you know, pace and post positions, but the race kind of went, it was, you know, kind of slower than anticipated fractions in some ways, but it was at least a, a fairly run race. Yeah, I mean, I think most people expected Uncle Cy to be up on or near the lead, and um, he had the lead and said pretty mod, pretty modest fractions as far as the Derby is concerned. Um, I thought for him he ran a nice race. He went up there. He didn't freak out like people expected. He slowed it down, and you know he just didn't stay. And that is what it is. Um, California Chrome, I thought, got a pretty perfect trip, and I don't mean that as a slight to him. He obviously was much the best in that race, but um, the Derby really to me is a race about trips, and he's the one who didn't run into trouble and. You know, you always are going to have some crazy trips in the Derby, but maybe this year was a little more chaotic than normal. Um, I think, you know, a couple of the big performances in there, aside from California Chrome, was Commanding Curve, obviously really close strongly from the back to get up to second late. Um, and a little shout-out to Samrod. He finished fifth. I don't think a lot of people would have ever expected him to be fifth. Um, clearly, he, you know, this was a bit too far for him, but... When California Chrome took the lead, I looked right back in the fat first horse I saw was Sam Rutt in the center of the track, and you know, by gosh, that horse just always, always gives it his all, and that's commendable. Those are the kind of horses I like. Um, some of the horses who had a lot of trouble. Um, Candy Boy was steady pretty sharply going into the first turn. I think, you know, Gary Stevens might have even come close to being unseated there. Um, Vickers in trouble for some reason. Rosie took him under a stronghold early, and. That was a little bizarre. I think that was just completely counter to how he wanted to run, and he ended up finishing last as a result. Um, Wildcat Red stumbled early on, and I think got a little uh, a little bit of a lesion, and he finished second to last. Um, Tapature lost the shoe. I've seen photographic evidence of that, yay, since I had him. Um, so, you know, a lot of trips here, but all in all, California Chrome much the best. Seems like there's been a lot of talk on Twitter about whether or not he was geared down or whatnot, I think he was. I mean, it was pretty clear to me. Victor Espinosa was celebrating um, maybe a little bit <laughs> too early there, but uh, I think he was definitely eased coming to the finish. The top three finishers were definitely the three best horses in the race. California Chrome sat third, took the lead, opened up by five. It was the exact same performance he had done in his last two races. Uh, the horse that ran second, commanding curve. Uh, you know, last race he was bumped at the break, closed strong, did that this time, so his form held up. And then Danza actually validated his Arkansas Derby race. He did have an inside trip again, and so he somehow manages to be the king of the inside horses. But he at least went the distance on three weeks rest. 
And then the only other horse that I even want to mention is uh, Metal Count. He was actually making a strong move, and in my opinion, if it wouldn't have been the Derby, uh, Danza would have been disqualified. I mean, Metal Count mm -hmm. was clearly running on for third, and Danza cut him off, and then he ended up finishing seventh. So Metal Count kind of validated his form, mm -hmm. and really those are the only four horses that ran well in the race. The rest mm -hmm. did what they did, and, and they just weren't good enough. So it doesn't really matter if they ran well or tried or whatever. I guess I don't give participation ribbons. Uh, I only count them if they uh, come in on the ticket. So the top three were the best three horses. California Chrome goes to the Preakness, and he'll only, you know, unusual this year, we've only got a couple of, uh, Danza hasn't even confirmed, and at the end of the day, I'm not sure he's actually going to run in the Preakness. Mm -hmm. So he's going to get uh, basically a bunch of new shooters, and most likely Ring Weekend, Pablo Del Monte, and Social Inclusion, and Baron will be the top guys that will be chasing him up. So he's got two weeks to, you know, to get it together and try to win the Preakness, and then the eyes of the racing world will see what he can do after that. Um, this week we've got two exciting three-year-old races, uh, one on both coasts, and may not be as exciting as the Kentucky Derby, but horses that have been in my stable mail since January are both entered, so there's nothing wrong with that. Let's start with the Peter Pan. Yeah, the Peter Pan, I think, is a pretty interesting race. A lot of these horses, uh, you know, either some of them were injured or just kind of, you know, maybe didn't cut it in the grade ones um, along in more major preps and, you know, kind of flown under the radar since. Um, Matterhorn, who we've talked about him before, um, he ran in the Allowance Optional Claimer, won by Constitution, but I think he finished last there. He's my tap at his, uh, when he broke his maiden over Harpoon in, as a juvenile, that was a really nice race, but since coming back from injury, he just really hasn't seemed to validate that form. Um, I just, I couldn't see him winning this race. Fabulous Kid is a little bit interesting. That You know, all in all, this is a race that I think is devoid of a lot of early speed. And he's, you know, of the horse who I would expect to be um, up more near the front in his last race, um, the Northern Spurs Stakes at Oakland. He was on the lead for almost the entire way and was just nailed right at the end by Bourbonize. He ended up finishing a close third there. Um, I don't typically like to see, you know, horses by the lead and then they just kind of cough it up late. Um, but that was a mile. And with that Lemon Drop Kid in his pedigree, he could be one of the horses who you know, would really like to stretch out. And like I said, at this race, just there is not a lot of speed here. So that could be beneficial for him. Um, definitely, we get Commissioner back. We saw him at Sunland and then Arkansas. He's just a plotter to me. I couldn't see him winning here at all. He's, he's slow. Um, for, but for me, the highlight of this race is Tonalist. We've talked a lot about him. We talked a lot about him. Um, after that allowance optional flamer, that Constitution won. Wicked Strong finished fourth, so obviously it looks, you know, at least on form to have been a pretty nice race. He finished second there, and that was the race where, you know, we, we really talked extensively about how he changed his run. They changed his running style to suit the bias of the track on that day, and he still ran quite well, despite showing a lot more early pace than is the norm for him. Um, typically, he's, you know, a strictly a come from the back, make one run closer type, but I kind of think that they'll have him a little more properly placed here just because there isn't, you know, much speed in here. Um, the one the one worrisome thing about him is that he is short on works. He only has one work in the last, you know, three weeks to a month or so. Um, it was a nice one. It was a five for long one minute twelve. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards being okay with that just because Clement, at least in my experience of the, the horses and races I've seen him, seen him run in, I just don't tend to see him forcing the issue that often. So I'm inclined to think that Tonalus is fit and ready to go here. Traditionally, the Peter Pan, you know, some horses enter that as a prep for the Belmont. So when I look at this field, I'm saying, okay, which of these horses would I even be tempted to play in the Belmont if they were to win this race? So to me, that pretty much gets it down to three horses right away. Uh, one of them is Commissioner. And you literally would have to reach into my pocket, pull my wallet out, and bet it for me because there's no way I'd ever bet on Commissioner in the uh, in any race. I just, you know, he is what he is. He's he runs 80 speed figures. He's got a great pedigree, and everybody likes the horse. But F, you know, he's not going to improve all of a sudden. He, he's a plotter that can just grind all day long. And if other horses decline, 
uh, he can be in the money, and if, and if they don't, then I, I don't think he has early speed or late speed. I think he just kind of runs one pace all the way around. And the one thing is is that he's ran at six, five different racetracks and six races. It just seems like they don't really have a plan with him. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the horse that intrigues me most is Tonalist. I mean, this is a horse that if he were to win this race by two lengths and really stride out at the end, that's a horse that I'd be looking at in the Belmont. Uh, mm -hmm. Tap it on the top side doesn't say 10 furlongs, but the mare side is Pleasant Colony, and the second mare has produced a lot of route distance runners. This is as good as it get. I mean, Pleasant Colony is a true 10 furlong influence on that mare side, and this is classic, you know, Evans breeding. So Tonalist is the horse that I'm picking based on him improving. There's nothing in the past performance that says that he should win. I'm counting on him running better than what he has shown, mm -hmm. and uh, again, he missed a couple of works, but uh, he was pretty sharp. He had worked three straight times, and he was primed to run good in the wood, and then miss that race. So, you know, if he would have ran in the wood, um, he would have had an extra race, so we'll see what he can do. Third horse is Fabulous Kid, mainly because of the Lemon Drop uh, Kid breeding. That's a horse that has the pedigree. He's lightly raced. The last race is better than it looks. I mean, Bourbon Eyes out finished him, and you might say, well, Bourbon Eyes got crushed at Sunland, but Bourbon Eyes at least had five races. He was a proven mm -hmm. horse, and he beat him in the last stride. And I'm always a believer, whenever a horse wins in the last stride, I just, I mark that off as just random, any horse can win in the final stride. I just never see those horses repeat again. So I'm almost always more on the side of the horses that get beat in the final stride, because I usually tap it down to just bad luck or bad ride or mistiming. And so I'm always usually more excited by the horses that get beat in the final stride than actually win in the final stride. A horse that is interesting, though, is the... Uh, the third of the trifecta of Tappets, uh, Tapasiro, comes up from Calder. Uh, this, you know, his pedigree is interesting. Two big wins. I like the fact that he paired up the 89 speed figures, and he stretches out, but he's got four sprints, and Calder is a good developing track. So Tapasiro is kind of an interesting horse for me. Yeah, I agree. He's one who I've looked at. It's the same connections as Gassi Guapo, who we saw in the bluegrass, and and I agree. I mean, Calder is not the easiest track to go run at, and he just looks like he's a horse who's starting to get good. I mean, it took him a little while to kind of get it together and break his maiden, but since he has, I mean, he's won by over seventh lengths twice in a row now. And, you know, I just think maybe he wanted to go a little bit further. A lot of his races earlier in the year had been sprints, and, you know, it seemed like once they got him going a mile, he seemed to be, you know, really kind of flourishing. I... I mean, you'd know better than me on pedigree. I don't know if he wants to go nine furlongs, but maybe you would know that a little better. And then our caravan, he beat Ring Weekend the last time, and he's kind of interesting. You know, he was another guy that got kind of outclassed, we're going to say, in the Holy Bull and that other race, but then he went down to Calder, and I remember telling you uh, early on, you know, the second mare on him was a really nice mare. It was a multiple stakes winner and a champion mare. So it's a homebred for three generations, and the pedigree is there for him to be a nice horse. But I, I just thought that Calder Derby was ugly. I'd rather have Fabulous Kid or I'd rather have uh, Tapacero. Uh, I'd even, you know, rather have uh, the rail horse, Matterhorn. Uh, I don't want any part of our caravan in this race. No, me neither. Um, like you said, he was just completely outclassed in the Holy Bowl and in the Fountain of Youth. And, I mean, I think that, you know, when you look at the you know, the charge of the past performances and you see his Calder Derby, you know, this is a classic example to me of a race that looks so much better on paper than it really was on per in person. Um, that race, if you, you know, I really suggest if you haven't seen it to go back and watch the video because, you know, on a pure talent level, I think Ring Weekend was definitely the best in there, but he went so crazy. He was pulling, he went carrot hunting in the first turn, and then just really bizarrely, he, he caught our, our caravan down the stretch, started to drift into him, and then just lost it, flipped out. I don't know if he spoofed himself or what, but that's where you got this nine and three-quarter length, you know, margin of victory from. But really, they were dead even coming down, and ring weekend was the, the horse coming down with some more steam, but just, you know, it was a really bizarre finish. So Candace is a masochist. She wants everybody else to share her pain and watch uh, a bad race. Normally I recommend people to watch good races, like Tonalist Maiden Win 
or that allowance non-winners of two, and Candace is up here saying, oh, yeah, if you want to watch a bad race, watch the <laughs> Golden Derby. All right. well, I had uh, no money, so maybe the, the people who, if you bet Ring Weekend, don't don't watch it again. Okay. <laughs> um, let's go out west to the Las Barrera Stakes, and this race is just kind of fun on a lot of levels. I know we've got some people that are looking forward to a few horses in this race, and, uh, I mean, actually it's got some nice talent. I mean, mm-hmm. it's kind of a... A race with a lot of question marks. Yes, I think like there's a lot of ho- a few horses in here that, you know, they've shown us the talent, but maybe have had trouble getting it done, and a couple of horses who, again, you know, we're starting to see some of these horses back who've been injured or gotten late starts. Um, we both talked quite a bit about Chelios on here. I'll leave him to you to talk about because I know you're a big, big fan. Um, I'll I'll get on Kobe's back. We have here. Um, he most recently ran out of Aqueduct at the Bay Shore and in a race where a lot of people think that he was the best in there. He did what he does. He walked out of the gate and he did not have an easy trip there. And I mean, that was a decent field. Coup de Gras won that race and I think he's pretty nice and it's coming to his own. And Kobe Speck finished, you know, a pretty close third despite, you know, really breaking slow. Which, you know, but that's the thing with Kobe Speck. I think people always say, you know, if he could just break fine, he'd be okay. But, you know, when you bet him, I think you just have to bet him expecting him to break bad because that's what he does. He's now raced, what, this will be his seventh race? And what, maybe in six or seven of those races he's walked out of the gate? So, you know, if you're going to bet him, just expect that. And, you know, for me in this race, I think on a pure class level, he is the best here. He is the one to beat. Um, he would be my pick to win here, even if he did walk out of the gate. Um, I just think he's more seasoned than a lot of these horses. I do quite like Chelios. Um, he returned from, uh, in to get some injury problems, he returned at Santa Anita uh, last month, um, but he lost to Ferocious in there, and Ferocious returns here, and it's just not that often that you just, that you see, you know, form reverse that quickly, and so that's kind of my issue with Chelios, so even though I do like him, and I do think he'll be pretty nice going forward, um, he's a little bit tough for me to take here for that reason. So, you know, for me, I think, that Kobe's back is definitely, definitely the one to beat. He won't be bettable by any means. Um, I do kind of like this ferocious guy. He's won two in a row now. And that win over Chelios that he had left him out was pretty solid. He ran a nice race there. And he gets the rail here, which is helpful. So, you know, I, th- I think Kobe's back over ferocious um, is probably the way to go. But, you know, even though this is a, an exciting race from a talent perspective, I'm not sure it's the best betting race. A um, couple of things. Uh, I think we're far apart in this one. I, I think Kobe's back is going to have a hard time with this track. I, I think it's going to be speed, and there's some good honest speed. I think Ferocious is legit. I'm picking him to officially win uh, just because I do think his last two wins were impressive, and he has that tail of the cat pedigree, which those horses are, are usually pretty classy. He gets the rail, smoking Joe. He looks for the third win in a row. Chelios, though, what I like about him and his maiden win was that he pressed a fast pace and then took the lead, and even though the, the margin of victory was diminishing, he had set such solid fractions and made a nice move, mid-race move that uh, the pace dynamic was just, that was a big win for me visually. Mm-hmm. Then he came back, and I thought the last time off the big layoff, they were just trying to get a race into him. You could clearly see that he was just staying at the rail, and then... Halfway down the stretch, all the other horses started to fade, and then there was Chelios, and he kind of just lumbered up for a second. He really didn't run in that race, so I I think he can improve off that, and then he also gets a major jockey switch to Gary Stevens from uh, Dick Van Dyke's kid in that race, and then uh, I just think the pedigree says route. I mean, this guy, he looks like a router, big, long neck. He doesn't have a... uh, He has a a rear end that kind of just slopes down with the long, leggy horse, so I think this horse is a Los Alamitos Steve Derby-type horse, so that's why I'm not picking him in this race. Uh, I think speed's been holding well. Uh, so I think Kobe's back is really going to be up against it. I just think this is another horse like Tamarando. The crop has now caught up with him. And a horse like Kobe's back, I really don't care about any of those races in January and February and December because these horses are just better than him now. Uh, 20% had a huge maiden victory. Uh, and 103-3, and three. I mean, that was a legitimate win. And then you've got the kitten reject. Puppy Aww. man. <laughs> Nick Rogers is taking the day off work to go watch uh, the puppy win uh, run in this race. I don't know why he's here. What? Whose idea was it to put him on dirt? I'm kind of confused. 
Um, well, yeah. the puppy, the puppy is a kitten reject. I mean, he's kind of had his. <laughs> Maybe he'll be like Shava. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. He he's never run on dirt. He always ran up in Golden Gate on the all weather. Then I think they threw him on the turf, and he was just. I mean, that was with enterprising and that crew, and he was just completely outclassed there. Um, so I, I mean, I kind of don't know why he's on the dirt, but who knows? I mean, I've seen crazier things that's before. Um, I don't get where you're coming back, coming on with Kobe's back at all, though. I mean, I go back to his win in the San Vicente. I get that was in February, but I thought that in at Aqueduct that he ran a really nice race there. So I I I don't understand where you're coming with him at all. Um, he he, in my opinion, is is definitely the one to beat him. And then uh, we also have to talk about the Puerto Rican sensation making mm -hmm. his American debut. The most highly anticipated debut since Mr. Frisky, the pride of Golden Gate, Tonito M and Sigmund Mendoza and Nick Rogers have been. Every time this guy works out, I get two emails the next morning. So yes. this horse must be good because I've been getting emails and notifications on Twitter and Facebook yeah. and everything else about this guy. Yes, I mean I. I don't know how to really judge his form all that much, but when I look through, he's winning by a lot. So, you know, he's kind of the wild card in this race. I don't really know what to expect from him. But, you know, we'll just we'll see what happens. I mean, yes, Bayerano, and, you know, I think this is kind of right up his alley. I mean, this is a race where if he runs well, he it's definitely gettable. He's, he's interesting. Um... One thing to note, he's ran in six races, and four of his wins have been in four-horse fields. So evidently, yeah. the horse shortage has extended to Puerto Rico. And <laughs> uh, actually, I've seen a couple of his videos on YouTube, and there isn't a lot there. But you know what? This is one of those horses that when you look at him on paper, he looks like he's, yeah. uh, he's ready to give him hell. But actually, yeah. he, he looks kind of, I don't know, I think he's going to be challenged here. <laughs> Uh, I think the puppy reject might actually uh, be better than him. <laughs> um, what do you think about Top Fortitude? He obviously had that big maiden win at Hollywood, and then you know he kind of disappeared off the face of the planet for a little while there. Obviously, something physical went on. He came back in that same race as Ferocious and Shelly Olsen, you know, did nothing. He finished last. But do you expect him to improve here, or do you just think he's kind of lost it? Um. You know, I, I'm going to make him, I think he's lost it a little bit, and mainly because he disappeared. All You know, he was entered in yeah. a stakes race, mm -hmm. and then it was, quote, unquote, just a minor foot issue, yet mm -hmm. he never made the work tab for, like, two months. Yeah. And then, when he came back, he had a new jockey, and I thought, I mean, actually, a lot of people were really impressed with that maiden victory. Uh, Kayla Straw ran up. That's why he, I mean, he got a really high speed figure, because he ran wide in that race and made a mid-race move into fast fractions. Mm -hmm. And there was two or three other horses that were just being bet off the board that day. One of them was a Bob Baffert horse. And everybody was just impressed with that big win. And then he went, you know, he was entered, and then he didn't work out for two months. He got a jockey switch, and then he was not even bet in the last race. So mm -hmm. to me, people knew something had happened. And to be honest with you, I have a feeling the horse had some kind of arthroscopic surgery or something removed. And... And I think the talent that was there is probably was removed with the with the uh, bone chip. <laughs> Sometimes that you know these horses aren't uh, like the bionic men. You know they they go in there and you know some horses can react differently. You know, but on paper again, you know that's where you kind of have to. You know, that's the art and science of handicapping. If everything was just run on paper, but those things that we do know, we do know that he was entered in a race. We do know that he was scratched. We do know that he, for some odd reason, had a jockey switch the last race. We know that he wasn't bet very much, even though every single speed figure in the world had him as the fastest horse. So when you start to get mixed signals, they kind of have to prove it to me. So mm -hmm. um, talent-wise, he could win. I just, I'm just i going to make him prove it to me. Uh, I'm excited to watch Chelios. My pick is Ferocious. And, well, you just have to love the puppy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited to see Chelios too. My pick is Kobe's back, um, though I do like Ferocious to get in the placings for sure. But I am excited to see Chelios going forward. 
Another race that's coming up this Saturday at Belmont and is going to be Grandeur, going to be hitting the turf. So quick yeah. tell people why they should tune in on Saturday to watch Grandeur. Okay, well, he obviously runs over in England, and he's come over here a few times. He's run three times in California, won twice, uh, finished second um, between Hollywood and Santa Anita. Then he ran over in the Arlington Million, and he drew the widest stall, and I think he had to go seven or eight wide into the far turn. Still finished respectably, though he came up lame in that race. And You know, I didn't really expect him to come back to the U.S. after that. He was intended to come to the Breeders' Cup uh, turf last year. They shipped him out to Santa Anita, actually, but then he ended up um, falling ill, so they didn't run him there. Instead, they ran him in Hong Kong in a much, 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 much tougher race, and he still ran a really pretty nice race there by most accounts. Um, I thought he ran well, at least. Um, this year, he's ran three times over um, on the all-weather at Lingfield, and he won the Winter Derby trial there. Uh, and then he lost in the actual Winter Derby, kind of a no-show actually, but it was a weird race. They had made some equipment changes on him that they promptly removed after that race. And then uh, most recently he just won over again at Lingfield. So, you know, he's a fun horse to watch because he's, you know, a very deep closer. You know, he if there is a knock on him, it's that he absolutely does idle on the lead. So you have to really time that move perfectly with him. And he's had Ryan Moore aboard him for a while now. And I think that, you know, as a jockey, he really suited, suited Grandeur because that's just kind of how he rolls with those late moves coming at the end. He knows how to time those really well. Um, he won't have him here. I think he has Le Peru, which, you know, on an turf race, he's one, one of the best. So I don't think that's such a bad thing. But, you know, for me, I think we're expecting maybe, you know, Frack Daddy. I think might be running. He's supposedly going to Ascot, and if he is, this the timing works for this race. Um, Amiris Prince, perhaps Real Solution, who of course, you know, won the Arlington Million after that DQ. Um, regardless, I think Grandeur is absolutely the class of the field, and he he loves running over here in America. So he's my pick, but I love him, so I'm biased. <laughs> All right. Well, our picks for the Peter Pan were both picking Totalist. Um, we differ in the Las Barrera. Candace is going with Kobe's back. I don't think he's going to hit the board. I like uh, Ferocious. <laughs> and uh, Candace says if you're bored and you really want to watch a bad race, watch the Calder Derby. Watch the Calder Derby. I say go watch Chelius' Maiden. But I guess I, I like to look at the positive side. And then uh -huh. next week we're going to come back. We're going to be able to preview the Black Eyed Susan. We'll mm -hmm. talk about California Chrome's bid in the Preakness Stakes. And uh, we'll let you know if anybody emerged from these two races this week to possibly move forward in the Los Alamitos Derby or possibly even in the Belmont. So that's going to do it for another edition of the Down to the Wire, and we will talk to you next week.